Let me just real quickly go over a couple of things that uh, I've already covered. We're teaching on what you need to do to be able to maintain the things of God. One of the things that happens with most people is that God touches their life, but they don't know how to maintain it. And most people think that it's God that causes His joy, His peace, His anointing, His healing to come and go. But one of the scriptures that I used was Romans eleven twenty nine 29 that says the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. God isn't the variable. God is not the one who moves in waves. You'll hear people talk about, man, there's a new wave in the body of Christ. And there's partial truths and stuff. I hadn't got time to put all this into perspective. But you know what? Technically, that's not true. God's not the one that chooses to pour out something for a little while and then he changes and does this. God has everything available. We use the example of like a radio station or a television station. They're always transmitting, but you know what? People aren't always turned on and tuned in. It's our receiver that only receives partial things from God. It's never God that just gives partial things. When you see somebody walking in the blessing of the Lord, it's not God who just chose to bless that person. God has chosen to bless every single one of us. There's just some people who get tuned in and learn how to receive. So with that as a basic understanding, then there are things you can do to fix your receiver, not God's transmitter. You don't have to beg God. This is where the vast majority of the body of Christ is, is begging God for things that He's already given. He's already released them. And if you keep begging God for something He's already done, you're going to get dead silence on the other end because God can't do anything that He hadn't already done for you. It's a matter of you learning how to receive. And you know, there's a lot of people uh, over the 20 years or so that I've been coming here, there are a lot of people that we have seen touched right here in this church. And we have seen great miracles happen, and yet there's only a fraction of those people whose lives have been changed that are here tonight. It's not because God didn't touch them, but it's because they don't know how to maintain these things. And when they begin to start losing their joy or their healing or their peace, they may ask God for help, but they don't know what to do to maintain it. And that's a shame. It really is a shame. And so that's what we've been talking about is what you need to do to maintain the things of God. And I tell you, this is really important. It's more important to maintain what you've got than it is to learn how to receive a touch from God in the first place. It really is. Let's look in Romans chapter 1. This is a passage of Scripture that we've been using. It lists four things here that people have to do, I believe they're progressive steps to walk away from God and to walk away from the things that God has been doing in your life. God will not withdraw from you because of some sin, some failure in your life. But you do have to cooperate with God. And here are some things that you need to do. In Romans 1, 21, it gives you these progressive steps away from the things of God. It says in verse 21, "...because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God." That's the first thing we talked about, to maintain a consistency and keep the things of God fresh and alive in your life. The very first thing you have to do is glorify God. And man, I'd love to preach that over again because this is really powerful and something that most people aren't doing. The word glorify means to value, to prize. And we spent a lot of time talking about how that really much of our problem comes because of misplaced values because we are letting other things compete for our attention and for our values that God should be occupying that place alone. And if you've missed that, I encourage you to please get these tapes. The second thing it says here is that they were not thankful, and that's what we talked about last night. And man, that is important. I'd love to preach that one all over again. This is something that is so prevalent in our society today. There's very few people that really are thankful we are grippers and complainers. And man, I said so much about this last night. There's no way I can go over this. But you know, one of the things I said, this was a little bit off the cuff last night, and I went back to the hotel and got to studying this out. And you know what? The more I studied it, I believe it was true. I said, you know, that Paul said that we are the savor of life in those that believe and the savor of death in those that perish. And that word savor there means smell, aroma. And I was talking about how that we are a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. And I don't know if that's literal or spiritual, figurative, but you know, nonetheless, the, 
Scripture says that when, you know, people offered sacrifices that it was a sweet smell unto the Lord. And I believe that, I don't know if it's actual or figurative, but we give off like an aroma that blesses God. But on the other hand, a person that's a griper and a complainer gives off an aroma like manure. Amen. (laughs) You know how manure attracts flies and they just show up? Well, I guarantee you, demons are attracted to griping and complaining. And some of you wonder, why do things always happen to me? It's because you're griping or complaining or you're drawing all of the demons in the parish. (laughs) And anyway, we spent some time talking about that. And I tell you, that's some really important stuff. You need to be a praiser. Praise is one of the most important things you can do. It just makes you focus on what God is doing because if you are the type of person that tends to look at the negative, I promise you, you will not continue to praise God. If you make a decision and start praising God, you must start seeing the positive because there's nothing praiseworthy in the negative. And so it just makes you focus on the things of God. I could preach that all over again. Anyway, you need to get that tape. The third thing that it lists here, and this is what we're going to be talking about tonight, it says the third thing is that they became vain in their imaginations. And again, I've mentioned this before, but I believe that this is a progression. The very first thing that happens when you start losing your joy or anything that God has done in your life, you know, some people say you're leaky vessels and it leaks out. Well, the first hole that it leaks out of is not glorifying God. And then that leads to not being thankful. If you quit placing value on the things of God and you get to where you're valuing something you don't have over there and lusting after it, then you know what? You will quit praising God because you're looking at what you don't have instead of what you do have. And then the third step is those two things lead towards your imagination becoming vain. The word vain here means idle or non-productive. It does not mean that it's not functioning. Every person sitting in this auditorium tonight has an imagination. You know, when you go to talking about imagination, most Christians don't like to talk about stuff like this. They either think that that's childish, that only children imagine daydream and stuff. I'm a realist. I deal in reality and I'm logical and I don't, you know, I, most people pride themselves on being a realist instead of a visionary, an imaginary person. So they look at it as being childish or some people see imagination is something associated with like Eastern religions where you sit down and visualize world peace and things like this. Well, there's abuses of it. You know what? There's abuses of prayer. Eastern religions pray. So does that mean you're going to quit praying because Eastern religions pray? (laughs) No way. You know, Satan only counterfeits something that's real. The very fact that other people have counterfeited, it shows that there is value to it. Your imagination is a very important thing, and every person's imagination in here functions. You may think, oh, I'm not a person that sits around and imagines, but you are constantly. That's the way that you do everything. Your imagination functions. The only choice you have, you don't have a choice of whether your imagination works or not. You just get to choose whether it's working for you or against you is the only thing. And this is saying that if you quit glorifying God, placing the proper value on Him, which means to magnify God. And if you quit praising God and being thankful, which is also magnifying God, if you don't do those two things, then your imagination will instantly, automatically start imagining negative things instead of positive things. You can't control that. Your imagination basically is a byproduct of where your focus is. If you are really valuing the things of God and praising God, being thankful unto Him your imagination will begin to start seeing things happen properly. Now, let me define some things here about imagination because, again, most people don't really think about this. But whether you realize it or not, that's the way that your mind functions. Your mind functions through imagination. You could not do basically anything without imagination. Matter of fact, if you look up the word imaginations in the Old Testament... Did you know it means a form when you're talking about it literally and when you're talking about it figuratively, it means conception is what that word means. Your imagination is actually the part of you where you conceive things. If you didn't have an imagination, you would be totally non-creative. You would be similar to an animal that just has to be taught 
and can learn things by rote if it's repeated often enough. But you know, one of the distinguishing characteristics between us and an animal is our imagination. It is a super part of us, and it's a very powerful part of you. And whether you recognize it or not, it is the part of you that conceives everything. Everything has to be conceived in your imagination. Before you can act anything out, you have to conceive it first in your imagination. If you can't see it with your imagination, you cannot do it. You know, this is why a builder uses blueprints and draws a picture. You all have heard this expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. You know why that is? It's because your imagination is the part of you that makes things work in your life. And your imagination is your ability to see something with your inner eyes instead of your physical eyes. You think in pictures. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I'm sure I've used this illustration here before because I use it a lot. But, you know, if I say dog, you don't see D-O-G. You don't see those letters. What you see is a picture of a dog. And it'll be based primarily on maybe a a dog that you have or had have. And there will be a lot of different pictures in your mind right now. There's not a one of you looking at a dog. I am not a dog. (laughs) Amen. You aren't looking at an animal, but you know what? In your mind, every one of you have a picture of an animal, and you got a different picture based on your personal experience. And with my words, I can change your picture. Some of you are thinking a little poodle or something. I could say big dog, and instantly your picture has to change. And then I can say big black dog, and your image changes again. Big black mean dog, and it'll change again. Big black mean dog with vicious teeth and it'll change again. And you know what? I can use words to influence the picture that you see. But you think in pictures. For instance, if I was to ask you, you know, where did you grow up? Now, some of you may have moved so much that you don't have a very vivid picture because maybe you lived in a million different places when you were a kid. But if you grew up in one house, and if I was to say, what was the house like that you grew up in? You know, you don't have to go get a picture and look at it, or you don't have to go get the blueprints. I can ask you, and you could start telling me. I'd say, how many bathrooms did you have? And you can instantly sit there, and you'll count them. Most of you don't have the information stored. It's not like you sit there and say, three bathrooms, and two bedrooms, four bedrooms. You don't have the facts stored. You know what? You've got a picture. And if I ask you, you'll go look at that picture and tell me how many bathrooms you had, how many bedrooms looking at your picture. That's your imagination. You can't do anything without an imagination. If I was to ask you how to get from here to the airport, some of you would say, well, you get out here and probably the best way is just go out and hit 49, which you go up 70, turn right and you hit 49 and go up and hit 20 and go out to, what is it, Monkhouse Road? And some of you would be saying, well, let's see, 70 is the first traffic light up here. You didn't walk out of this building and see that traffic light. How do you know it's the first one? You didn't see it with your physical eyes, but you know what? You picture it in your mind. And if you say it's three traffic lights, you know how you know it was three? You didn't have that information stored. You looked at it. And that's the reason that if you've never been from here to the airport, you couldn't tell me how to get there because if you hadn't seen it, you can't picture it. Is everybody following what I'm saying? You use your imagination. The point I'm trying to establish right here is some of you think, oh, I don't want to talk about imagination. I'm just a realist. That's crazy. You use your imagination constantly. It's the conception part of you. You can't build anything. Those of you that make dresses and stuff, you have a pattern. You know what a pattern is for? It helps you picture it and see it. This is why a picture is worth a thousand words. It's like when you are using instructions that instead of just reading words, they'll have words of explanation there, but you know what? They'll have a picture showing you what the finished product looked like or what this part is and how it goes together because it helps you imagine. Your imagination is the creative part of you. That's the reason that it literally means conception. There can be no creativity without you using your imagination. And the sad thing is that if we quit glorifying God and being thankful, that forces your imagination to start. It'll work, but it'll work against you instead of for you. 
you'll get to where that you will start conceiving and seeing negative things. You'll start being fearful. You'll start operating in unbelief instead of faith. You'll find out that your imagination will go to work and against you. The doctor will say you're going to die, and instantly, man, your imagination sees you in a casket. You know, if they say something like, say, for instance, if you had a relative that died of cancer or a friend that died of cancer or something, and if they say cancer, instantly you will see that person suffering, and you will see yourself in that position. Your imagination will just go that way, and the sad fact is that most people's imagination is super negative. It's working against you and it's conceiving doubt and unbelief and fear and worry and hatred and things like this. You know, one of the qualifications of an elder over in uh, the book of Titus chapter 1, it's also listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3, but one of the qualifications of an elder is that they have to be sober. And you know the word sober here doesn't mean not drunk. It's not talking about not drinking. It's talking about the word literally means void of speculative imagination. That's one of the qualifications of an elder. And boy, the Lord has really used that in my life because when, when you get started in ministry, you want people to like you. You don't want to go in and cause problems everywhere you are, and so you'd like people to like you. If you aren't careful, you'll get to where you minister for people's acceptance instead of ministering for the Lord. It's a trap that you fall in. And the Lord ministered this to me, and I remember going to Kansas City, and there was a couple there that, I mean, they would always drive a 100 miles to come to any of my meetings. They had just been so blessed. They were really good friends. And anyway, they were always there. They never missed. Well, one time I went there, and they were noticeably absent. And you know what? The time before, the year before when I was there, I had called them out and I'd given them a prophecy that wasn't one of these generic prophecies that, you know, it could fit anybody. This thing was so specific. I either, it was supernatural. It was 100% God or it was 100% flesh. There was no compromise. And when I didn't see them, you know what? I got to thinking, speculating and saying, I bet you that I missed this. I bet you they're upset with me. I got to imagining and seeing them spreading rumors about false prophet and talking about me. And, you know, the more I thought about it, if I'd have seen them, I was just ready to punch them right in the nose. And the next night, they showed up. And they came up and they said, oh, we're so sorry we missed. We had a funeral, death in the family. We would have never missed otherwise. And you know what the Lord showed me? That, you know, I was sitting there and I was about ready to take an offense over something that didn't even happen. I was speculating, imagining what they were thinking and what was going on. Y'all don't look at me in that tone of voice. I know that you do the same thing. Man, I've been in so many churches where the pastor doesn't speak to somebody and they're ready to quit the church because the pastor didn't speak to them. And they imagine that it's because he doesn't like them and other things. You don't ever think that maybe he's got somebody else on his mind but you. You know, there could be a million reasons. This is what the Bible is saying when it says judge not. Did you know that there's other scriptures that tell you that you have to judge? Some people are confused over this, but Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, it doesn't tell you not to judge. It just says with the judgment you judge, you are going to be judged. So be merciful. First of all, take the beam out of your own eye before you take the little speck out of somebody else's eye. And basically, the kind of judging that it's talking against, like if you're walking down an alley and a person walks up and, man, they got on, you know, they're, they're dressed like a gangster and they got a gun in one hand and a whip in the other and they're headed for you, you better judge. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you saying, this does not look good. <laughs> it would be to my advantage to head the other direction. There's nothing wrong with that type of judging. But you know what? What it's talking about is don't judge why they look that way. In other words, you can say this doesn't look good. I better take evasive action. But the judging he's talking about is you trying to figure out why they did it. Man, I could preach a whole message on this. When you're in relationships, this is what you should do. If a person says something that offends you, there's nothing wrong with you going up and saying, you know what you said offended me. And here's how it made me feel. There's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong is when you say, what you said is wrong because, and then you start trying to judge and speculate why they said what they said. They may have said it because they didn't realize what they were saying. 
They may have said it because they were brain dead that day and <laughs> something wasn't working. They may have said it because somebody else offended. You don't know why people do what they do. You know, I have just made a decision and I've taught my staff this. After the Lord showed me this, I said, you know what? I will not speculate on what's going on. I will not accept hints. I said, if you're mad at me, if you dislike me, you're going to have to come tell me. I can tell that maybe a person isn't this friendly, but you know what? I will not speculate about why they aren't friendly. That's their business. And if they got something against me, you're going to have to tell me you got something against me. I am not going to speculate about it. That's where there are many of you that have already judged a person You've already condemned them as to why they're doing what they're doing and you don't have a clue why they did what they did. You know what that is? That's all imagination. Your imagination is a powerful force. Matter of fact, you cannot consistently function contrary to the image you have on the inside. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. And this imagination is the part of you that does this. Did you know that every last one of you have an image, a picture of who you are, what you're like, what your personality's like? And the sad thing is most of us have not let the Word of God paint that picture. Most of us have had other people tell us, experiences tell us, and things like that. And we need to get an image on the inside of us of who we are in Christ, what God's Word says about us. But most of us, see, are going off of a different image. There are people that you may give every time the bucket comes by. And you may fulfill the Word of God. You may give and plant your seed and sow. But you know what? As you think in your heart, that's the way you are. There are some of you who give and you're doing what you're told to do. But you know what? You see yourself poor. You see yourself in lack. You have an image. Your imagination has locked you into a thing, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You will fulfill the image that you have on the inside. There's some of you that see yourself as an introvert and shy and bashful, and you know what? It will dominate and control you. But you can change that image. I used to be a super introvert. Couldn't even look at a person and talk to them. Couldn't look at a person in the face. And you know what? God has totally changed all that around. Now I'm an extrovert to the max because I changed the image on the inside. You can change who you are. You know, one of the things that happened when the Lord began to start speaking to me, I started changing that image on the inside. When we lived in Seagaville, Texas, we were so poor we couldn't go out and buy things. And so, you know what? I started praying over things and believing God. I started working on cars. I didn't know a thing about cars. But you know what? I started getting in there saying I can do all things. And I'd go in and work on cars, and I fixed cars from things that I can't tell you why they worked, but they worked. We had a washing machine that somebody gave us that the brake on it had broken and stuff, and I took that thing apart and looked at it, couldn't figure it out, prayed over it, did something to it, and that thing worked for years after that. And you know what? I've just got an attitude that I can prosper, I can do anything. I went in one time and started developing pictures, and I told this guy, I said, you'll be blessed because you hired me. <laughs> you know, I've got a different image. And his business was on the rocks. I pulled it out of bankruptcy, and within two months, I'd never developed pictures in my life, and it had turned his business around so much that he offered me an equal partnership, no money up front. If I just run the thing, he'd give me 50% of that business. And that's when the Lord called me to go to preach it, and I had to tell him no and left. But you know what? I've changed my image, and I can do all things, and I can tell you it's the imagination part of me that I was dealing with. Your imagination, if you will start glorifying, worshiping, and putting value in things on God and being thankful unto God, if you'll do the first two things that we've talked about, you'll find out that your imagination will begin to start conceiving things differently. Instead of you being fearful of the future, you'll start having hope and anticipation and faith for it, and you'll start seeing positive things come to pass instead of negative things come to pass. That's really important. Look in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, 3 is a familiar passage of Scripture to a lot of people. It says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, 
whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Did you know that this word mind here is the exact same word that was translated imaginations in the Old Testament? This is talking about when your imagination is stayed on the Lord, he will keep you in perfect peace. Your imagination is your ability to picture something on the inside. And most of us don't use our imagination when it comes to relating to the Lord, but you should. That's what I'm trying to get across tonight. You know, when I read the Word, here's the way you meditate on the Word. The vast majority of the revelation I get from God does not come from reading the Word. Now, reading the Word is vital and it's very important because you cannot meditate on what you haven't read. It's like when you read the Word is when you put the data entry into your computer. You've got to have the data entry in there to be able to manipulate it and do anything with it. But you know what? It is not when I read the Word that the majority of the revelation come. It's after I've read it, I sit down and meditate on the Word. Meditation is where the real revelation and the power is released in Scripture. And the way you meditate is to use your imagination. For instance, when I read about David and Goliath, you know, I remember going out when I was just really getting turned on to the Lord, and I went out. I had to go outside of the house to make a mark that was uh, nine foot six because our ceilings were only eight foot. But I actually went out on the house and made a mark where Goliath would have been, nine foot six. And I stood next to that so that I could see and picture what it was really like to go up against a giant. And picture things. You know why it's so important to go to, like, the Holy Land? If any of you have ever been to Israel, people talk about, man, it's a life-changing experience. It makes the Word come alive. You know why that happens? Well, the group I was with, they thought it was an epiphany, whatever that is. (laughs) It was just the presence of the Lord is so great in Israel that they were swooning and doing all of these things. You know what it is that makes that so special? It allows your imagination to start seeing clear. I remember going down in the valley of Elah. I got out of the bus, and I'm the only one that walked down to that little stream, and I picked up five smooth stones out of that stream, just exactly the way that David did, to help me picture what was going on and to see these things. And man, it makes the Word of God come alive when you can picture what the Word's talking about. When you walk on those same places that Jesus walked, you know what? It makes it come alive. And this is how the Word of God comes alive. You see things. You sit down with your imagination. After you read the information, then you sit down and you let the Holy Spirit... You don't use your imagination just to come up with whatever, because it depends. If you've been watching some junk on television, it may be going in the wrong direction. But you let the Word of God... You let the Word of God control your imagination and you start thinking about those Scriptures and you will start seeing things in Scripture that you don't see with your physical eyes. You have to see it on the inside in your imagination. You know, when the Bible says that you're healed, you've got to take it and meditate until you see yourself healed. Most people don't see themselves healed. Most people see themselves sick. Most people see the pain and the hurt and they see this and they see themselves deteriorate. They've already got a clear picture. They're told what it's going to happen, the stages it goes through, and they're constantly checking themselves to see where they are in this progression. And they're seeing this and they see the end result out here of death or pain or whatever. And you see those things. You know what? You need to take the Word of God and say, man, that is not what I see in the Word. And you need to take scriptures and meditate on it until your imagination sees yourself running or jumping or sleeping all night or living without pain or whatever's your problem. You know, when I first saw people raised from the dead, I took the Word of God that says the same works that Jesus did shall we do also and greater works than these shall you do. And I started speaking it, talking about it. I took all of the scriptures where people were raised from the dead. There's eight instances in the Bible Nine, if you count Jesus. I took all of them. I meditated on it. I saw those things. I saw when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, I would close my eyes and I'd see me standing there and say, Lazarus, come forth. I saw me doing all those things. I got to where I thought about it so much that I dreamed about it. I started having dreams of raising people from the dead. And then I started seeing people raised from the dead. 
You know what? There's a reason why it happens for some people and why it doesn't for others. If you can't see it on the inside, you will not see it on the outside because your imagination is where the conception takes place. And many of us are just letting the physical input of your eyes control your imagination. The Word of God will paint you a picture that you can replace those natural things. Maybe you've never seen a person with a broken arm instantly heal, but you know what? You can see it in here. And you can meditate on it until you start seeing it. Once you see it on the inside, then you can see it happen on the outside. Maybe you've never seen anybody in the situation you're in set free, but you can find it in the Word of God. And if you'll meditate on it, you can conceive that and you can begin to see it and it'll change things. Look over in Genesis chapter 6. This is a negative example about imagination, but nonetheless it shows you the power of imagination. In Genesis chapter 6, in verse 5 it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Brothers and sisters, it's a shame, but you know what? Even though many of us have had an encounter with the Lord and been born again, the truth is that the vast majority of our imaginations are evil. We see negative things, things contrary to God's Word. We see ourselves failing. We see ourselves angry. We see ourselves bitter. We see ourselves rejected. We see ourselves in ways that are contrary to what God's Word says. And most of us allow our imagination to just run rampant. Most of us honestly don't think that there's anything wrong with imagining things. But this shows us that God saw the imaginations of the thoughts of their heart. Here's another passage that goes along with this in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9. This is David giving instructions to his son Solomon right before he died and before Solomon became the uh, king. And David spoke to Solomon and said in verse 9, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found of you, but if you forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Notice that this says God sees all of the imaginations of the heart. There's at least a half a dozen times in the Old Testament where God brought judgment on people for their imaginations. Again, most of us think that what the deal is is actions. Man, you can't go out and commit adultery. Man, I can't do it. People will fight that. But you know what? They will allow themselves to think things in their imagination and conceive in their imagination. And then they will just fight and resist, white-knuckle it, trying to keep from acting out what they've thought in their heart. Man, that's stupid. That's just like a woman who doesn't want to birth a child And so she's trying not to give birth, but she has no restrictions whatsoever on having physical relationships. She's going out and she's conceiving constantly, but then she has to abort or try and keep from having a birth. That is not the way to keep from having children. If you don't want to have children, don't have a physical relationship. I can guarantee you, you won't have a birth. That's the way to do it. Well, in the spiritual realm, people aren't recognizing that your imaginations are where things happen. And I can guarantee you that there are very, very few things you could watch on television that will not give you negative imaginations and present sexual things to you that will cause you to lust and to do things like this. There's very few things you can watch that won't teach you to get angry and bitter and fight back and defend yourself instead of turning the other cheek and do things like that. And whether you know it or not, those visual images are painting pictures on the inside of you that when you come into a crisis or when you come into a similar temptation, you know what, you're going to be tempted to act that out because it's already been conceived. You can literally get to a place to where you don't conceive things and if you don't conceive it, you can't do it. You can reach a place to where you don't know how to sin. Some of you think, oh, brother, not so. You can do it. You can literally get your mind so stayed on God that all it's doing is conceiving joy and peace and power. If you keep your imagination stayed on Him, you will be in perfect peace. Isaiah 26, 3. 
It's true. We are causing ourselves tremendous amount of problems because of the way we allow our imaginations to go. Very few people feel any responsibility over your imagination. Very few people even know what your imagination is. They just allow their thoughts to run rampant. They will think negative things. You know, I've had people come to me before and here they are married to somebody and they're having trouble in their marriage. And then they go to a high school reunion or something and they see their old flame. I'm thinking of a specific instance where somebody came back and says, do you think I married the wrong person? Do you think I missed God because they're having trouble in this marriage? And you know what? They wanted me to help them judge whether they missed. And I said, that is stupid. I said, it doesn't matter whether you made a mistake or not. I said, never think that stuff. There is nothing positive that can come of that, and there is tremendous amount of damage that could come from it. What are you going to do? Divorce them? Go get another one and violate the Scripture? I said, that's not an option. You should never let your thoughts go there. You know, there's things that come against me that I refuse to think. I could sit down and think all kinds of stuff. You know, when we started on television, it increased our uh, expenses and all of these kind of things. I had to think out some of these things to see how much money we needed so that I could communicate with my partners and make some plans. So I thought some of these things, but you know what? I have never allowed myself one time to see myself fail in this endeavor. I have never seen myself failing. I have never allowed my mind to go there and say, what am I going to do if we don't have the money? And I have to back up and go off and say, we missed it. I've never thought it. I've never gone there because that is not what God told me. I will not think things contrary to what God's Word says, and because of it, I don't conceive it, and I'm not tempted with it. But I can guarantee you there's many of you that if God was to tell you to do something, the very first thing you do is sit down and figure out every reason why it will not work, and allow your imagination to go down that road and see yourself failing after you've considered all of this junk. Then you say, God, can I believe you for this? It's just like trying to swim with weights on you. It's not going to work. That is not the way that God wants you to do it. Most of us don't understand how important your imagination is. Some of you, every once in a while, you get depressed and you say, I just would feel better if I got down and had a pity party. And you sit down and start thinking, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. We used to sing this when I was a kid. I'm going to go eat a worm, amen. (laughs) You know what? Here you are, an adult, basically doing the same. Nobody loves And you know it's not true. It's just like Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. God, I'm the only one left. And yet, in the 18th chapter, who was it? Obadiah told him that there's a thousand preachers still left that I've fed with bread and water and I've been hiding them in a cave. He knew better. He'd been told just a matter of days before that there was still a thousand preachers left. And yet, he started whining, God, I'm the only one left. He knew better. But you know what? He just allowed himself to get into a pity party and it wound up costing him his ministry, costing him a lot. He knew better. There's some of you that know better, but you feel, I just feel better to get down and just gripe and have a pity party and get depressed. Don't go there. Don't allow your thoughts to go there. Don't see yourself failing. Don't see your prayers not being answered. And there's some of you in here thinking, you can't live this way. Yes, you can. There are some of you that are honestly so negative that all it takes is a little whisper from the devil. I mean, you get a word from the devil and you make a paragraph out of it. Man, he can go on vacation because you are just wonderful at amplifying and magnifying. Man, you have a pain in your chest and you know it's a heart attack and you think about it until, man, you are already having a heart attack from the fear that you've got. When the truth was, it was nothing to start with. There's people that take the smallest little thing and amplify it. You know what? That's your imagination that does that. And the sad thing is most of our imaginations are evil. Most of our imaginations are going in the wrong direction. Let me show you another thing. Look over here in 1 Chronicles 29. David gave an offering in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. I won't take time to read all of this, but it amounted to about $1.5 billion worth of gold and silver that he gave out of his personal bank account. He had already given $5 billion towards the building of the temple, 
out of his government treasuries, but this was his personal bank account, $1.5 billion. That's not bad for a shepherd boy. He was prosperous. And when he gave, the people got so blessed that they started giving spontaneously and they gave $3.5 billion. So altogether, it was a $5 billion spontaneous offering and they were so blessed, David started praying and you know what he was doing? He was doing what we've been talking about. He glorified God. He placed value. He recognized God. This was not coercion. This is not something that a man could make happen. These people, this was supernatural. He put value on what had happened. And he started thanking God and saying, God, all we've done is give you that which was already yours. Everything that we've got that we gave you, you gave it to us in the first place. And he started thanking God for the blessing. He remembered where he came from. He glorified and thanked God. And then he said this down in verse 18. He says, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, Keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. He says, keep it in the imagination of the thoughts of their heart. You know what he's talking about is very obvious. He's talking about God help them remember. Did you know your imagination is the part of you that remembers? And I wished I had about an hour or two to talk about the importance of memory. But boy, this is vital. I've got a tape series on how to prepare your heart. And I'd really encourage you to get that. It's powerful. But it says in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 14, it says, Rehoboam did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Getting your heart prepared is vital. And did you know that memory is one of the most important things you can do to prepare your heart? Here's the way that I look at it. You know, it's been 32 years since the Lord supernaturally intervened in my life, and I've been glorifying God, thanking God, and I remember what God... I make monuments in my life constantly. We just came through Arlington, Texas. You know what? We went by and saw our house. I drive by the field where I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I got these places. On my property, I didn't tell you all this, but in August I was working on this trail and... I had this huge boulder that I dug out, and the boulder was about three feet or something tall, three feet wide. And I dug a hole, and I was moving this boulder over there, and I was trying to get it in just the right place. And anyway, I slipped, and my hand got caught under this boulder, and it rolled down my arm and over my head. My head was on the ground, and this boulder rolled totally over my head. It weighed over a ton. And man, I jumped straight up in the air and started running and saying, in the name of Jesus. And you know what? Everything worked. I had knots and bruises all over me, but everything worked. My hand was swollen until January, but it worked. You know what I did? I put a monument down there. I've got a thing there that says, August the 25th, 1999, Jesus saved my life when this boulder rolled over my hand, arm, and head. And then I wrote down Psalms 116.6 that says, The Lord preserves the simple. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and you know what? I walk by that thing every day. I got a monument there, and I don't forget that Jesus saved my life. Here's the way that I look at it. You know, some people get up in the morning, and you don't want to go sin against God, but really, you don't have a clue whether you're still going to be faithful to God by the end of the day. You hope that you are. But God forbid that the devil just put the wrong person in your path, the wrong circumstance, because you may become an adulterer before the day's over. You don't want to, but man, if the situation dictated, it might. Some of you, if somebody was to hurt you, you don't know for sure what you'd do. You might not be able to forgive them. But you know, the way I look at it is, I've got 32 years worth of walking with the Lord. I've got all of these things that have happened in my life that for me to yield myself to Satan and let him do some things in my life, it's like I've got all this huge life, this history with God that I can't just turn my back on. But there's some people that wake up in a new world every morning. It's like you don't remember what God did. I've had people come to me before and I'm not going to serve God if I can't get this prayer answered. And yet, man, I mean, it's like they need $100 and yet they've been miraculously provided for. They've been healed of cancer. Great miracles have happened, but they forget all of that. They're just so focused on this one thing that they're ready to quit and give up. 
Man, it makes a spirit of slap want to come all over you like, man, don't you remember what God done for you or something? You know what? Your memory is a powerful force. Your memory can make a huge difference. I heard a story about a man and his wife that had just gotten married, and on their honeymoon they were driving somewhere. The woman was driving, the man was asleep in the back seat, and they had a head-on collision, and the man lived through with very few injuries. The woman nearly died, and anyway, she finally got her health back, but she lost 12 months of her memory. And that's the period of time that they meant, fell in love, and got married. She could still remember her family. She could remember her name. She could remember what she did. But she had no recollection of this man whatsoever. And you know what? They were totally unable to maintain any relationship. He eventually had to move out of the house and start courting her all over again and make a brand new relationship because she could not have a relationship with a person that she forgot. I think most of you could relate to that. You know what happens? Most people, they get into a marriage and they start dealing with the pressures and they forget the things that really made them fall in love with that person in the first place. They forget the good things. They go to focusing on the negative things. Their imagination gets to magnifying those and they forget the good. And you know what? You can't live with a person that you don't remember anything good about. Them. I've actually had... Married couples before sit down and I say, now look, there's something good in that person. I said, think of something good. And I've had married couples before say, I can't think of anything good in that person. <laughs> and I just tell them, I said, hey, did you love them when you got married? Oh, yeah, they were great. And I said, well, then guess whose fault it was that they turned out the way they did? Because they were okay when you got them. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. You know what? Your memory is a very important force. Let me give you a couple of scriptures on this. Look over in Second Peter chapter 1. It talks about that if you don't have certain things in verse 9, it says, He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Did you know you can forget what Jesus has done for you? I've had people come up before and they're just so upset they're going to walk away and I just start reminding them what God has done and it changes everything around when they remember. I had a woman come up in Chicago two years ago. I called out through the gifts of the Spirit that somebody was trying to commit suicide or had been thinking about it. And this woman came forward and I remember she started telling me everything in my life is wrong. And what I did, I prayed for and through the gifts of the Spirit, the Lord gave me four instances where Satan had tried to kill her from the time she was a little girl. And I reminded her of them. And I said, do you remember when you were around four years old and that somebody tried to rape you and kill you? And I said, you have looked on the negative side. Look what happened. But I said, the Lord says that they tried to kill you and it's a miracle that you lived. Instead of magnifying the negative, you ought to say, man, look, God saved my life. And then I went through four other things, three other things, and I just reminded her. And you know, by the time she got through remembering how God had delivered her, this woman who had been thinking of suicide was on her knees praising God, thanking Him for His grace and mercy and praising God. You know what the truth is? God's done awesome things for every last one of us and there's not a reason for any of us to be upset except that we forget. We forget the goodness of God. Your memory is a vital part and your imagination is how you remember stuff. You've got to start using your imagination in a positive way. He goes on to say in verse 12, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Your memory needs to be stirred up. You need to remember things over and over and over. And he goes on to say in verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. And then he says over in chapter 3, Verse 1, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. You can stir yourself up through memory. You know, I was in a service. I don't even remember how many years ago, maybe 10 years ago or something. And I was in a service in Lima, Ohio, and there were 600 people. And we had seen so many good things happen. They actually had people standing outside the building with the windows open and they were listening through the windows. 
And they started singing, How Great Thou Art. And you know what? I had a flashback at my dad's funeral. That was my dad's favorite song. They sang, How Great They Are. I remember as a 12-year-old boy sitting there thinking, God, this doesn't compute. My dad just died, and we're singing about how great you are. And I remember praying a prayer and saying, if you really are great, reveal yourself to me. Give me a purpose for my life. And man, I just had a flashback of the faithfulness of God, what God has done in my life. And you know what? That memory just, man, brought me to my knees. A memory can stir you powerfully. And it's amazing how very few of us take time to remember. It takes effort to remember. You have to be still. You have to turn off the television, turn off the radio, and you have to spend time reflecting. Did you know there ought to be time in every person's day where you spend some quiet time just remembering? You'd find out it would transform your life. And your imagination is the part of you that does that. You go back and picture things. You know, my mother and I were just over in Marietta, Texas, going and talking to people that knew our relatives and remembering things. It's important. Man, every time I get a chance, I go to these places that have been really significant in my life, and I just sit there and remember. Those are some of the most powerful times I have. And you know what? It makes a difference in my life. Our whole society is getting away from this. It would be unusual for most people in here to know very much about their grandparents. Some of you would, but great-grandparents, probably very few. We are so into the moment. We're so occupied with our own self. And yet, I was over in England not long ago, and I preached in a guy's church, and then he took us to his home for uh, lunch afterwards. His family had lived in the exact same house since the 1400s and something. And he took me into that house and he says, right here is where my great, 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 great grandfather was born and here is where they were married. And he knew this. And you know what? As he was sharing these things with me, it was just boggling my mind and I was thinking, man, the history that this guy lives with, how would that impact his life and his actions knowing that, man, you know, what would his grandparents have been doing in this house? How would they have conducted themselves? That would enter into your reasoning and into the things that you do. But most of us, we're disconnected from anything. We don't think about stuff. Memory is a powerful force. And in the Lord, that's the reason he told us to erect monuments and not tear down your neighbor's landmark and to do things. You need to rehearse your victories. When the Lord rebuked David for his sin with Bathsheba, he says, David, don't you remember that I took you from following the sheep? Don't you remember that your name wasn't even put in the hat when Samuel came? You were out keeping the sheep. They didn't even think you would fit. And don't you remember what I did? And don't you remember how I've overcome your enemies? And don't you remember that I gave you all of these things? And if that wasn't enough, I would have given you more. He referred him back to memory. I can guarantee you, for you to go out and do some of the stuff you do, you have to forget the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. I'm not encouraging anybody to go out and try this, but I would bet you that if you were going to go in to a prostitute and have a relationship, and right before you get in bed say, let's just pray and dedicate this to the Lord. Let's, let's just praise God for His goodness. I bet you it would ruin the whole thing, amen. I bet you you wouldn't be able to do it. You know what, if you were a thankful person, and see, to thank, you have to remember, all of these things are interrelated. And if you were to do all of this, you know what, it would create such an atmosphere in your life of the faithfulness and the goodness of God that it would prevent you from doing some of the things that you do. Your imagination would start focusing on positive ways, and you would see the goodness of God and see things working out instead of seeing things fail. You know, a person who worries is a person with a vivid imagination in the negative realm. If you're a worrier, if you're anxious over things, you got an imagination that's functioning in the wrong direction. You can turn that around. This is really important stuff. I don't know if you're making the connection, if you're getting what I'm saying, but this is vital that your imagination, it's where things are conceived, you've got to start using it in the right way. Look in Mark chapter 6. I want to share a passage with you about Jesus. This is where he fed the 5,000. And in Mark chapter 6, 
It says in verse 35, And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. And he answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. There's so much I could say about this. I wish I had time to develop it. But you know what? The disciples were saying, send them away. They knew the need, but you know what? They didn't imagine it. They didn't see them as having the ability to meet the need. They wanted to send them somewhere else. You know, the church is doing this today. We're sending people to psychologists, to bankers, to doctors, to lawyers, when the truth is we're the one that has the answer. They don't need to depart. We could meet their needs. But you know what? Most of us don't see that. Most of us don't see ourselves as able to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, so we send them somewhere else. And Jesus said, they need not depart. Give them to eat. Most people would think that's unreasonable, but you know what? Jesus wouldn't have asked them to do something that they couldn't have done. They could have fed these people. They had the ability to do it, but they'd never seen themselves as able to feed 5,000 people. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? They pulled their wallet out of their pocket. They were looking at their natural resources instead of looking at the spiritual resources that they had. And he said unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And then when they knew, they said, Five and two fish. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. Notice it says in verse 41, he looked up to heaven. You know, when it says he looked up to heaven, this is talking about more than lifting his head. This exact same Greek word, it's the word anablepo, or I don't know how to pronounce I just know a little Greek and a little Hebrew. One has a deli and the other one runs a laundromat. But you know, I, I think it's something like anablepo, amen. And what this means, the word blepo means to see. And the word ana can mean against, but when it's used in a compound, it literally means again. It's a repeat of something. What this is talking about, he saw again. He saw twice is what it's literally saying. This same word is translated receive sight 14 times in the Bible. When Bartimaeus received his sight, same word. When it talks about blind eyes being open, it's this same word. So when it says that he looked up, this is talking about he did more than lift his head. You know what? He saw twice. He saw differently than his disciples. You know what he did? He saw on the inside. He saw in the spirit realm instead of seeing with his physical eyes. They were looking at their physical resources. They were limited by what they could see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. Jesus could see past the physical, and he saw into the spiritual realm. That's what this is talking about. When he looked up, this isn't talking about raising his head. It's talking about that he perceived it with his spiritual eyes. In other words, it's talking about his imagination. He had a pure mind that was able to see things by faith. He wasn't limited to what he saw physically with his eyes. He could see whatever God's Word said. And he saw, not with his physical eyes, but with his spiritual eyes, these five loaves and two fish being enough. The disciples looked at it and then looked at the crowd and saw it not enough. And you know what he did? Most of us, we look at the little bit we got and say, Oh God, it's not enough. I'll never make it. We curse it. Jesus blessed what he had instead of cursing it. Most of us are cursing. Well, God, I could never do what you called me to do. God, I can't preach. He blessed it. And you know what he did? He fed 5,000 men. That's not including the women and the children. He fed over 10,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Then he had them take up the fragments, and they had more left over than they started with after everybody had seconds and thirds. And you know, I hadn't got time to explain all this to you. I've got a Life for Today Bible back there that will explain this. But if you were to figure out the logistics, if Jesus would have just broken the bread and it started multiplying in his hands... And then he gave it to the disciples, and the disciples ran to these people. There was something like 102 groups of 50 for each disciple. If you take 10,000 people, 
divide them into groups of 50. There's something like 102 groups for each disciple. Each disciple, if they could carry an armload of stuff and go pass it out, I figured up how many minutes and then having to run back and forth, the quickest this could have happened would have been seven hours. And it says that this was towards even. They said it's getting late in the day. Send them away. So they didn't have seven hours because before sunset, the disciples got into the boat and went to the other side. So this didn't take very long. So logistically, it could not have happened that Jesus broke this bread and then the disciples came running to him and got this. You know how this happened? The only way it could have happened, Jesus blessed it, broke the bread one time, gave them to the disciples, and the disciples didn't have a whole truckload of food laying back here that they were running back and forth. You know what? They had just one little fish, one little loaf, and they went out and started breaking it, and it multiplied in their hands. That's the only way this miracle could have happened. So Jesus, in effect, blessed this food, gave it to his disciples, and the disciples had to have a lot of faith to walk towards this group of 50 hungry people with this little bit of food and start passing it out. You know, some of them could have stopped and said, but Jesus, I need more. They didn't need more. They had enough. That one little loaf, that one little fish was more than enough for thousands of people when it was blessed if they could see it spiritually, you know what, whatever you've got is more than enough. If you could get your imagination renewed so that you didn't see with your physical eyes, if you saw your true potential, if you could start seeing with your heart and see what God has really given us, if you could take the Word of God and let it paint a picture and show you who you are and that you have the same power that raised Christ from the dead living on the inside of you, and it's not that you need to go plead with God and get something more. You just need to look up and receive sight and see what you've got. You know, if you could do that, you could go to the masses and you could see people healed, delivered, set free. You would have words to say. You could flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Anything that you need would function. But the problem is... We aren't looking up. We aren't receiving spiritual sight. We aren't seeing with our inner man. We aren't using our imagination to see ourselves like God sees us. Instead, we're looking in the mirror. We're listening to what everybody else thinks about us. We're looking around at other churches and thinking, well, do other people do this? And you're looking and taking comparisons and you're letting other people paint the image on the inside of you. And you need to go to the Word of God and find out what does God's Word say? And whatever it says about you, that's who you are. And that's what you can do. And you need to see yourself that way. Most of you have never seen your real self. If I was to ask you what you look like, you'd go to describing your outward man, but you don't know who you are in Christ. Most people don't know who they are in Christ. And so we live like a beggar. We live poor and depressed and defeated. When the truth is that God's already given us everything, you just hadn't seen it. In the 8th chapter of Mark, Jesus prayed for this man who was blind and he made him look up. Same word. He made him receive sight. And his eyes were open. You know, you need to get your eyes open, your eyes of your heart. And the way you do this is by starting to glorify God. All of these things, it's like they are built on each other. If you will glorify God, start putting value on God, and I mean magnifying God, taking Scripture and saying, God, you are above every name. Cancer's got a name. Whatever you've got's got a name. You're above every name, and if I can name this thing, you're above it. Start magnifying Him and putting value on God and making God bigger, and then start thanking Him for the things that He's already done. If you would rehearse your victories... Use your memory to see things and begin to start thanking God. You know what would happen? Your imagination would start seeing good things happen instead of bad things happen. You would start seeing yourself succeed instead of fail. Your imagination would start functioning for you instead of against you. And your imagination wouldn't be vain. But if you don't do those things, if you don't put the right value on the things of God, and if you are not thankful and remember the goodness of God... I can guarantee you, you're going to be one negative person. That all you got to do is get a whisper from the devil and man, you just run wild with it and see him destroying your life. And that's where most people are. Man, your imagination is important. And you don't get to choose whether or not it functions. You just get to choose which direction it functions, whether it's functioning for you or against you. It's your choice. 
And these are the ways that you do it. It's all built on things. And the next thing we'll talk about tomorrow night is that if you don't do these first three things, if your imagination is vain, then I can guarantee you your foolish heart becomes darkened. We'll talk about what that is and how you cannot function contrary to your heart. Your heart is the most important thing. I tell you, brothers and sisters, this is so simple, you've got to have somebody to help you misunderstand it. There's not a hard thing that we've talked about. Everything I've talked about has been super simple. And yet it's amazing. You know, people would rather go to great effort, organize prayer where there's millions of people praying for God to pour out His Spirit and just move and make you victorious without you having to renew your mind, without you having to glorify God and be thankful and do anything. Man, just pour out the Holy Ghost so that I can go back to my television and watch my soaps and stuff. God forbid that I have to spend effort focusing my attention, use my mind. Man, people are just trying every way they can to circumvent this and put it on God. Just ask God to pour out. Bring in an evangelist. Let the evangelist do it. You know what? It's just as simple as what we're talking about. If you would consistently do this, glorify God, be thankful, let your imagination start working in a positive way, I guarantee you, you do these things and it's impossible for you to fail. That doesn't mean you won't have problems. Problems will come, but you'll win. You'll succeed. It's impossible to fail. You will overcome. It's just that simple. And if it really is that simple, which it is, the only reason I can see that everybody doesn't latch on to this is either, one, ignorance, they haven't seen it, or two, They just want somebody to wave their hand over them and make it happen. They don't want to go to any effort. It's one of those two things. It's either laziness, I guess you could call that carnality, or ignorance. Well, you can't claim ignorance tonight, (laughs) amen, because we've shared the truth with you, and so that really leaves it. It's just a matter of are you going to be a doer of the Word or, or not? It's really that simple, and this is good. Good stuff. Change your life. Amen?